In this second hour, we're going to continue with our study of basic doctrine number eight, the laying on of hands. <clears throat> laying on of hands is a practice that has been continued over the centuries, and even some uh, churches today uh, lay on hands. Um, we are looking now at New Testament missionaries, and by that I mean how it is that the New Testament handles this whole idea of men going into the ministry. Our first study is the disciples of Jesus, and in this particular case, this is an introduction to the third disciple, which is Peter, and this would be sermon number 34 on that, and going back to what is known as the magisterium. So this would be the second time on a magisterium. But uh, before we begin, I'd like to say that I had a very uh, wonderful conversation this morning with one of the ladies of the church who uh, said that uh, she had been on a hike uh, in Linwood. And it reminded me of some pictures that I wanted to show you. And um, those of you who like to visit places, I think that you would probably like to visit the place that I'm going to show you. Uh, the place that I'm going to show you is the site where the Lord Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, gates of hell, where are they, what are they? And so let me just give you, at least at this point, just the gentle go through with a big uh, tooth comb, um, a, treat, a geographical treatment of the gates of hell. <clears throat> the gates of hell is an incident that takes place in the life of the apostle Peter and as you can see on the screen, the, I have divided the life of the Apostle Peter into four major sections. Uh, the blue section uh, is his uh, early life. The red section is the days that surround the cross. The green section are the days that are after the cross basically 50 days after the cross. And then the white section, which is the last section, is from the day of Pentecost and into the church age. So our study for now is taking us into the blue section, which is this section here. And the particular event that we want to look into is number six on this list. And that is when Jesus said to Peter, uh, upon this rock I will build my church. And then it's followed by a rebuke, but we'll get into that a little bit later. So this is that particular time when Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. There has been controversy and even wars about what it means thou art Peter, or you are Peter. And what it means by on this rock, I will build my church. Two different words that are used there. We won't get into that this morning, except to say that um, it all takes place at the headwaters of the Jordan River. The Jordan River is the one and only river that goes from the north of Israel to the south of Israel and it dead ends in the Dead Sea. It is the lowest spot on earth. Water cannot drain out of there because there isn't a spot lower for the water to go into. And so this is a very salty sea. It's at the very bottom. It's really a sewer more than anything else. That's where things that die go to dissolve or get changed from one chemical to another. It's not a real happy place. But we want to talk about the other end of the river, and that is the headwaters. Now, I don't know about you, but I like, when I hike, I like to go to different places. 
Like one day I'm looking forward to going to the divide, you know, the continental divide where the water sheds either to the west or to the east, just so that I can have one leg on one side of the line, the other leg on the other side of the line. I was at Four Corners, you know, that portion in the southwest of the United States where all four states meet at one point, kind of neat to be there. I've been at several places, at several borders, and I've been able to put one foot in one country and the other foot in the other country and say, hey, isn't this great? I like doing that kind of stuff. One day, I would like to go to the headwaters of the Mississippi River. Now I know that probably my wife won't want to accompany me there because I'm sure it's, it's a city where there's an awful lot of those little jiggers and little insects. There's a ticks, but no talks there. They're just ticks. And uh, I would like to go there, and you know they've got a place at the headwaters of the Mississippi where people have thrown these big, like, boulder-like rocks so that you can cross from one side to the other and say, I crossed the Mississippi River on foot. And if you don't want to get your feet wet, you can step off the boulders and wade across. That would be neat. The headwaters of the Jordan River, something similar. The headwaters are all the waters that melt, or all the snow that melts from Mount Hermon. Remember how I told you it's, you know, 9,000 feet. That's a lot of altitude. And all of that ice melts, and because the soil and the geological structure is such there that when that snow melts it doesn't just run off it starts to run off but the rock and the soil is so porous that it percolates and makes its own water table and so it comes out in springs what they call springs at the base or at the foot of Mount Hermon well there is this one place at the base of Mount Hermon that is called the Gates of Hell. It's called the Gates of Hell because in years past, before they had the big earthquake and water used to flow out of this one cave, the hole in the cave was so deep nobody could get to the bottom of it. They would have ropes with you know measuring uh, devices and they just could never get to the bottom of that hole. Kind of like Crater Lake. How deep is it? Nobody really wants to say with any amount of certainty because you, nobody's been down there. And this is a hole that is made because of the geological structure of the area. And water would come out of this hole and it would seep into a runoff which later would become the Jordan River. There is the hole. Now, as you can tell, this is somebody else's photo. It's a stock photo. So it's got all me all over it. But this is called the Grotto of Pan. Pan. Pan is that Greek god who is goat from the waist down, except for his head. His head has got horns and he's fuzzy and furry all over the place. And he is a highly sexualized creature. And because of this, the people worshiped him. And guess where they worshiped him? This is the place. They call it the gates of hell because anybody who would go into this hole would never come back up again. And anybody who came out of that hole was obviously a god or something because they always had some quirk in their head and they would do some stupid things that the gods would do. So this particular grotto is about 40 feet wide and about 40 feet high. Okay. A 40-story a four-story building is 40 feet high. 
So in your mind, go around and say, you know, where is there a four-story building like that? Well, you can just look over here to the uh, Angel of the Winds Arena. How high is that? About four stories. Not counting, you know, the big towers or anything, but just the roof part. That's how big this is. Okay? And you see that background, that rock there? That's actually one huge cliffside. It's called a monolith, which means it's made out of one rock. And Jesus said to Peter, your name is Peter, or Petros, and upon this rock I will build my church. There's a difference between the name of Peter and the whole cliffside. But more about that later. This is what the Jordan River looks like at the headwaters. The water is crystal clear. It's ice cold. It is a fabulous place. People go there. There's so much coolness that comes from this water that people put on jackets. In Syria and Israel, think about it. It's 110 degrees on most days, but you have to wear a jacket because it's so cold there. And look at those waters. They're, it almost reminds me of Wallace Falls, doesn't it, you guys? You can almost hear the roar, and you can almost feel the mist that comes off of the stream. Okay. This is called the Sanctuary of Pan. And what this is, it's, a, it's an artist's rendition of what this used to look like in the day of Jesus. Okay, you can see that there are some actual Greek architectures there. And uh, you have temples that belong to certain gods. And um, let me get my cursor and I'll point this temple here. It's built right at the base of that grotto that I showed you a couple of pictures ago. Now you can see the height of this building and how the grotto goes even above it. Okay, and then behind it you can see that monolith that cliff, which is called a rock. Now this is important for us because, and we'll see this later on, that when Jesus says to Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, he is saying, when I build my church, it is going to be as formidable as this cliff. And I'm going to build it on people like you who have faith like you. And you would be just like a little chip or a little rock that falls off this cliff. And then he says, and the gates of hell, which is this hole, this hole in the cliff here, shall not prevail against it. This was the center of idol worship in that area. People would come from all over to visit this worship center. Um, between the two buildings you can see that there is a staging court here, a, a stage. This is where there would be dancing and there would be religious types of things that would be done. Some Christian churches have gotten the goofy idea that you can't worship God unless you dance. Guess where that idea came from? <laughs> the picture's right there. You know, it's been around for thousands of years. As Billy Graham used to say, you know, it's not the new morality, it's the old immorality. And that's what's infecting our churches today. You get this biblical illiteracy, you get some of this erroneous thinking, and they come up with these goofy things. I've been to some of these church services where they get the young girls that wear these chiffon type dresses and they've got these ribbons and they're dancing around like they do in the Olympics. You know, I'm sorry, but that's just not worship. Okay. Now, 
you see that there's another oops, another stage over here. It appears that this was the worship of Pan. And this is where people would have sexual relations with goats. It was the most demeaning, the most obscene, but that's what people considered to be holy. And people would stream, just like they do for Funko, with big long lines, they'd go there because somehow they wanted to get some of that blessing that comes from having these obscene relationship with animals. And apparently Jesus took his disciples to this area and he said to them, who do people say that I am? And they gave him a couple of answers. Then Jesus looks to Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? And this is a question that I think every preacher that has ever come to Matthew 16, 16 asks. What do you think of Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Is he your savior? If you haven't made that decision for Christ, you need to make that decision. Jesus asked Peter, and you know, why would he ask Peter? Well, first of all, because Peter, you know, he's the person that would always put his foot in his mouth. And uh, he had toes and he would wiggle them inside his mouth and strange garbled stuff would come out of there. But this time Peter said the right thing. You are the Christ, that is you're the Messiah, period. You are the son of the living God. And we'll go into these words because I tell you what, they're choice. There's so much meaning that's hidden in these words that will blow your mind. And thou that was said as this environment was uh, surrounding them. Okay, so let's begin then with our uh, message today. The reason that we say this is because the Roman Catholic Church has placed this fallacious uh, doctrine or dogma on an erroneous interpretation of Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. The Roman Catholic Church bases its belief on the flawed and false interpretation of these verses. It is the interpretation of these verses which consists in one of the biggest distinctions between Protestants and Roman Catholics. Number one, the church requires a pope, and Peter was the first one. So here you have a distinction. Why are we called Protestants? Because we have protested that particular dogma. <coughs> we do not believe that the church requires a pope. And we do not believe that Peter was the first pope. Number two, when the Bible does not directly address an issue, then tradition is to be followed. Now, tradition does not mean, you know, we have a birthday party for everybody on their birthday. And uh, there, since there are so many people that have birthdays in May, we just hold the one big birthday party for everybody. Well, that's kind of a tradition. That's the way we mostly understand. But the legal definition of tradition. The ecclesiastical definition of tradition is this, that if the Pope says from now on we're going to do it like this, it's going to be done that way. If there's a history in the church that something was done, that's the way it's going to be done. So, the uh, the idea is that tradition is to be followed and tradition is set by the magisterium 
It's a body, an academic body, at the center of the Roman Catholic Church, and they say what tradition should be. The Pope is given the extraordinary power of ex cathedra, that is to speak, ex cathedra. That means that whatever it is that he says will be part of the tradition. You might say, the Bible is my rule. The Bible is my constitution. The Roman Catholic Church says, yes, that's true, but off to the side, we also have the tradition. And the tradition has exactly the same value, if not more value, than what you hold to be a Bible. So this is why this passage is so important to us. Because Jesus said to the first pope, on a rock, or on this rock, I will build my church. And so the question is, are we going to take those words to say that he is the first pope and that the Bible has been uh, given uh, or has given that particular instruction and we, since the 1500s, have been wrong? That's what we are going to study. Ex cathedra is when the pope sits on his papal throne and he utters words and signs his words, puts his imprimatur on it, and it's called the papal bull. I know it sounds gross, but it doesn't mean what you think. It is an infallible pronouncement. We hold that all men are liars and that only God tells the truth. What's in the scripture is always true. They say what the Pope says is also true. He cannot lie. He cannot make a fallibility. Okay. So, up until now, we have looked at the text of Scripture. We've looked at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. We have even discussed a little bit about the district of Caesarea Philippi, in verse 13. We, number three, we have discuss the issue of Jesus' identity as hypostatic union. And even though we have discussed it, we have discussed it with a very light uh, treatment, and today we're going to look at it in another light treatment, although a little bit heavier. Number four, the context of Peter's confession. Peter's confession is, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Because he said that, then Jesus said, Blessed art thou, or you are blessed. Because flesh and blood didn't reveal this truth to you, but my Father which is in heaven. It's called a blessing. And then, almost in the next breath, Jesus has to rebuke Peter. And says, Peter, what is the matter with you? Okay, so... Our prologue, verses 1 through 12, uh, is the prologue to this important event in Peter's life. And Jesus is teaching his disciples that they should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Question, what is leaven? Well, that's that powder that you put in soda uh, baking biscuits, you know, and it makes the dough to rise. And um, that's called leaven. In Jewish theology, and leaven was acceptable, except when you're talking about the holy things. When there are holy things, then leaven is not acceptable. And there's just maybe one or two exceptions in the Bible where leaven is looked at with a good light. So, Jesus tells his disciples that they need to be careful because of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, two different religious groups in Israel. And leaven is that corruption in the doctrines of these two political or religious parties. So what was the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? 
Well, Jesus identifies for them that it's the doctrine of the scribes, or we could say the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and that their doctrine is evil. We're going to see an illustration of what that evil is in the next uh, few moments. Now, after the first 12 verses are gone through, now Jesus asks the question, whom do men say that I am? In other words, what's the buzz you know, about me? What are people saying about me? And um, it isn't so much that Jesus wants information about rumors about him, but he wants to know what people believe him to be. It is a quest for information about an identity issue. So the question is kind of strange. So I called it a strange question. And following strange questions, there will be strange answers. So I gave you the last time a whole bunch of trick questions. We won't go through them again, but you'll recognize them from last time. Where was the Declaration of Independence signed? At the bottom of the page. Trick question. Everybody knows that. Um, what can you never eat for breakfast? Lunch and dinner. Trick question. Everybody knows that. So question number six, if you had uh, three apples and four oranges in one hand, and then four apples and three oranges in the other hand, what would you have? Very large hands. It's... Trick questions. So, unforgettable questions next. Now, we didn't do these last week, so, but you're all familiar with them. And uh, I used to have this on my ringtone for a while, except it was too long. But uh, first one, you've got to ask yourself one question. Do you feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Okay. I used to have it as my ringtone because I thought it was kind of cute. It's too long because he goes into it. This is a 41 Magnum. You know, well, anyway, that's question number 10. Everybody knows that. Question number 11. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? If you've ever watched Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you know that this is one of the classic scenes. I have been in rooms full of lawyers, and they quote it in unison. Everybody knows that. You know, is it this type of swallow? Is it the other kind of swallow? Does the swallow have a, a pebble in its beak or doesn't have a pebble in its beak? Question 12, where's the beef? How could we ever go, you know, from this world to the next without taking that question with us, right? I mean, that was such a great uh, commercial campaign. Uh, question 13. Can you hear me now? We see the guy now, and he's working for a different company. And now when he asks the question, it takes on a different Nuance. Can you hear me now? 14. Pardon me, do you have any gray poupon? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you don't really appreciate it unless you've been the owner of uh, Bentley or uh, one of those classic cars, uh, uh, one of those silver shadows. Uh, you know, like, really? <laughs> So I'm going through this exercise because I want to get to this issue about questions. Because Jesus has asked a question. Whom do people say that I am? So there's strange questions. And questions are used basically for four purposes. And we can see that all four of them are involved in this issue. But two more than the others. Okay, first reason is to elevate. In other words, to elevate a product. 
you know, some guy will stand up and say, you know, this is uh, the cereal that I eat in the morning, and this is better than all the others. I've had Cocoa Puffs, I've had Fruit Loops, but this is the best. It'll reduce your diabetes, or it'll reduce your uh, cholesterol, or it, it will put you in the right mood when you get to work. This is the one. So sometimes the question is asked just to elevate a particular product. This is the one. Sometimes the question is asked to compare. Will this product work under a different environment? Haven't you ever asked yourself the question, will a gun fire underwater? Well, now that we've got those certain kind of um, bullets that are pressured sealed, guess what? They do. So you don't want to point it at yourself when you're skin diving and saying, hey, I want to try an experiment, because uh, you will not be laughing. So questions are sometimes asked, will this product work in the dark or will it work in another country? Uh, can I uh, use this bus pass on another bus line? The third reason that questions are asked is to clarify a matter. Sometimes the question is asked to uncover the real intent of the questioner or of somebody who's made a statement. You're just saying that because you're jealous. You know, that type of thing. It's pretty petty, but a lot of people still do that. Another reason is just to bring up the issue or the question and simply to make that point clearer. Like, does it get any better than this? Or something to that order. And that's what questions are used for, is to clarify something. So what do you think that Jesus was doing when he asked the question, whom do people say that I am? If you're clarifying the matter, you might say, can you tell me more about this issue? Because I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm not clear enough. Can you tell me more? Or why do you say that? Because you want to clarify. These particular questions, the clarification questions, are usually questions that you ask to affirm what you already know. But you're not so sure that the other person does. So you ask the question because you want to bring it out of them. A fourth reason is to focus attention on a point by eliminating the other points. You don't mean the, we're going to eat here, do you? I mean, this is such a lousy place, question mark. Yeah, we want to eat at McDonald's. Say, focus your attention on whatever. In other words, you want to direct the conversation. And there are some people that are experts at this. And they do it just merely by asking questions. They aren't going to say, I think we ought to eat at McDonald's. Instead, they'll say, you want to eat at this puke joint? Well, there's a perfectly good restaurant someplace else. Oh, there it is, the Golden Arches. So they just love to manipulate the conversation to get you to go there. So Jesus asked this question. In this instance, the question revolves around the phrase, the son of the living God. Because that's what Jesus wants to know. The son of the living God. It's, there's two, two clauses or two interrogatories in the question that's asked by Jesus. Um, and the answer comes back, you are the Christ. That's the first part. Second part, the son of the living God. Well, that is what is being asked here. And um, a 
Before we begin this, I think we ought to dismiss uh, because the Son of the Living God requires for us to have a little bit more thorough understanding of the hypostatic union. And so let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, the scripture tells us that to know Jesus Christ and to know him aright is to have eternal life. Our Father, we have believed in Christ. We have eternal life. But Father, we find ourselves in that place where we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that as we go through these particular lessons that we would see how wonderful he is, how grand he is, and the marvelous things that he has done for us. So we bring these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.